Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, the government says that those affected by the Grenfell Tower fire will be offered proper temporary accommodation by this Wednesday, promising that they won't be forced to live anywhere they don't want to live. But many residents are still frustrated with the speed of the government's response and the confusion over who's actually taking charge on the ground. Our senior home affairs correspondent, Simon Israel, has a story. Nineteen days have passed, but everything remains so vivid for those who survived and for those who lost loved ones, but whose grief is on hold. Missing presumed dead is not enough. Lawyers' desks are becoming stacked with papers, victim statements, planning documents, local authority accounts, ministers' letters, regulations, fire safety audits, and much more. The striking issue for me at this moment is the incredible bonds of closeness and connection that exist in the residence. Two families that escaped from very high up in the block came out late from the 21st floor. Uh, presence of mind to, to, to form a connected snake line going down, grabbing onto the rail in pitch black, children put in the middle, adults at the end, making sure that they, they, they got down. And then two children from that group, in fact, breaking away and getting lost in the chaos, falling over bodies that are lying on the stairs. Today the government said it was getting a grip. Wednesday's deadline to offer housing to all victims and survivors was on course to be met. Some families have indicated that they wanted to remain as close as possible to their former home. But when they received their offer, took a look at the property, they've decided it would be easier to deal with their bereavement if they moved further away. Some families have decided that for the same reasons they would prefer to remain in hotels for the time being. Every household will receive an offer of temporary accommodation by this Wednesday, but every household will also be given the space to make this transition at their own pace and in a way that helps them recover from this tragedy. But on the ground, there's a different impression. One emerging through word of mouth, through local contacts, and through those the victims trust. We're getting a set of um, claims that X, Y, and Z action is happening. And then when you get feedback from those directly um, affected, um, they're saying, well, no, it's not actually happening. So, for instance, last week we had a show of hands about those people that had actually been allocated a social worker, and many of them said they still haven't been allocated a social worker. It's still a feeling on the ground that people aren't properly signposted, people aren't being made aware of, of what's available and what help is there. And it's coming more from the community itself and from friends and by word of mouth. And, rather what, about, than... and what about the mistrust? Well, mistrust is a serious issue here. And so much so, it's already questionable as to whether the public inquiry can get underway in its present form or even with its government-appointed chair. The community's aim is to wrest back control from those behind this catastrophe. Simon Israel reporting. Well, earlier I spoke to Eleanor Kelly, Chief Executive of Southwark Council and the spokesperson for the Grenfell Fire Response Team. That's the one that is being led by Whitehall. I began by asking her whether Wednesday's deadline to give at least temporary accommodation to all those left homeless by the fire will be met. Yes, we will meet that target um, by Wednesday morning. The issue is, of course, that very many families are not ready to accept um, temporary accommodation. They're not ready to make um, any move. And there's a wraparound service around every single family making that um, decision and helping them to to come to terms with both with what's happened to them and what's on offer. Wraparound assessment, what about wraparound therapy? Well, the services that are provided to them, they have, um, those people who are bereaved have family liaison officers and everyone also has a key worker. Um, and so the services that are brought to them are across the piece in relation to housing, social care, um, mental health support, 
um, all of the services that they might actually need. I think that the problem on the ground seems to be still that people say not enough is being done and they don't seem to know enough. They're not getting enough information. Do you connect with their anger? We absolutely connect with their anger and I think uh, particularly in relation to those people from the team who come from local government because we work very, very closely with our communities all the time. And I think that the issue here is the layer upon layer um, of people who've been impacted. If you work with the bereaved, if you work with the survivors, mm. you get a much, um, a, much, a much closer connection and a different picture that they understand that they've been offered accommodation, they understand um, that it's fine if they say they don't want to move there and people have been given multiple offers, um, they can understand it. I think the broader issues um, around the community, both on the Lancaster West mm. Estate and in the community of North Kensington, um, are an issue for uh, particularly the council to, to, to move forward on. The um, sort of chaos, though, seems to be sort of exemplified by what happened to people's charges, the idea of a bank account paying out for accommodation and and although the pledge has been given that now no no rental of course would be charged at all um, that could have been done by somebody in accounts in, in Chelsea instantly I think there is an issue about understanding the impact and the impact on the systems within the council I think some of what was happening in the council with the resignation of the chief executive and the and the continuing pressure um, on the leader and the deputy leader that resulted um, in them standing down on Friday actually did um, put pressure on the council in relation to what we would have seen as being mm. business as usual and, and really sort of like think, thinking those things through. The unfortunate thing mm. is that it then looks insensitive and I don't think that the officers on the ground or the politicians for that matter are insensitive. I just think that there are aspects of it that were not well handled. Not, not, not insensitive but disconnected. I mean what, what, what really struck me and I was there quite a lot was that the council didn't really seem to know very much about the tower or who lived in it. Um, well, I think that those are questions for the council to answer, and I know that the Metropolitan Police did say that the initial information that they were provided with was inaccurate. In but it makes your job much town. more difficult too. Um, it, it does, but I think that across the agencies within the response team, we are actually um, very able to, to mm. identify what those mm. issues are and to work our way through. The, 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 the really big thing is numbers. Numbers of dead, numbers of survivors, identities of people who, who have survived and all those that have, have died. I think that the, um, that the issue is that it is going to take everybody's knowledge around making sure that those numbers are fully and properly identified. I think that the um, undertakings that have been given about not prosecuting uh, people in relation to uh, illegal occupancy um, or not following through issues um, around illegal immigration are extremely important because we do actually believe that there are still um, some people who are effectively hiding and that means that they're not coming forward to get the support that they need to help them to deal with the trauma that they've been through and that's really important. Eleanor Kelly, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you very much. Well, the government said today it is on course to honour its pledge to find new accommodation for the survivors of the Grenfell Tower disaster within three weeks. But some residents are telling ITV News they are not happy with what they've been offered so far. Tonight, Kensington and Chelsea Conservatives chose their new leader, who immediately apologised for the way the authority failed local residents in the fire's aftermath. Behind each window was a home. 129 in total, many completely incinerated. While work continues here to establish how many residents died, those who survived are growing impatient with the efforts to rehouse them. Most, like Antonio Roncolato and his son Christopher, are living in hotels. Short term, it's acceptable, but he's received a letter from the government promising he'll be found an appropriate flat in the same area by this Wednesday. So far, the two he's been offered have not been suitable. I do not want a, uh, a basement flat next to a very busy congested road. I'm sorry, I don't. I want something that reflects my standard of living that I had before. And I repeat, due to somebody else's negligence, our, our home burned, was down, is down, and people lost their lives. Today, the government reiterated its promise to offer housing by Wednesday although it didn't say when survivors would actually move in. I've been monitoring the progress of rehousing and we will honour that commitment. Every home offered will be appropriate and of good quality. 
What we will not do is compel anyone to accept an offer of temporary accommodation that they do not want. This is one flat made available to survivors near Westminster. Only eight homes like this have been accepted out of 126 offers, but those responsible insist they're doing their best. Whilst there's an acknowledgement that the response was slow at the beginning, I think the response now is really pretty good. Tonight, the Conservative group of Kensington and Chelsea Council elected a new leader who sought to strike a more conciliatory tone. This is our community and we have failed it when people needed us the most. So no buts, no ifs, no excuses. I am truly sorry. Contrast that attitude with former leader Nick Paget-Brown. The new leader has just apologised for, for the way the council... Yeah, I, has, I think you should talk to the new leader. I'm very is, happy that you do. Thank you. Have you anything to say to Grenfell residents? Survivors like Antonio hope the change of leadership here at the Town Hall will bring with it a change of attitude. They hope it will mean they'll be rehoused quickly and appropriately. They think it's the very least the officials here owe them. Dan Rivers, News at 10, West London. And while survivors of the blaze wait to be rehoused, the inquest on two more residents who didn't survive were open today. Westminster Coroner's Court heard how the body of Italian architect Gloria Trevisan was found on the 23rd floor where she'd been living with her partner. She'd called her parents to say goodbye after the smoke and flames cut off any hope of escape. Miss Trevisan had to be identified by her dental records. The court also went on to confirm how one of the oldest of the victims died. 81-year-old Ali Yawa Jafari lost contact with his wife and daughter while trying to escape. Firefighters pulled Mr Jafari from the blaze, but he died from breathing in smoke and heart problems.